On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down and their, their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day, raised again. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where are Lord Jesus, today we celebrate your resurrection. Thank you for the hope that we have in you. That even in the middle of our troubles, we have hope for this fact, that you live. Help us to remember this truth today and forever, we pray in your name. Amen. Oh, you stand as so we sing together. Christ the Lord is risen today.
uh, with another song to just praise God that He is risen, He is alive. And if you've had half as much chocolate as my kids have, you'll be more than happy to continue standing on your feet, getting out some of that excitement and that energy as we sing this song, He is risen, He is alive.
Heavenly Father, we declare He lives. He is risen. You are risen. You are here. And you are alive. And you deserve all the honor, all the glory, all the power to you forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I invite you to take your seats as the choir come and join us. I'm going to bring you a, a song really that declares that Jesus Christ, the Lamb, is worthy of all our honor, all our power, all our blessing, all our praise.
The reading this morning is from Colossians chapter 1 and I'm commencing at verse 15. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. Through, for through him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God, in all his fullness, was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemy, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence, and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. The good news has been preached all over the world, and I, Paul, have been appointed as God's servant to proclaim it. May God give us understanding of his word this morning. And what would you do if you were God? If you were God, what would you do? Surely, you know, dreams of ultimate power have some sort of appeal to all of us, that inner dictator... Uh, ready to express itself, what would you do if you were God? Well, for a start, I think I'd make everyone agree with me. <laughs> that sounds fine, doesn't it? It would make the world a much, much better place to live in and to work in. Well, for me anyway. Um, I don't know about the rest of you, but it would be great for me. And I think the second thing that I would do if I was God, I would have to redesign the food pyramid. Are you all familiar with the food pyramid? You know, so on the bottom level, all the things that you're meant to eat the most of, what's on the bottom level? Healthy stuff, someone says, so, you know, cereals, grains, uh, all those legumes, you know, beans, all that type of stuff. All that stuff, which really, quite honestly, actually, is pretty boring most of the time, isn't it? So if I was God, I think I'd redesign the food pyramid, and I think I would make that bottom section of the food pyramid, you know, the most important food for you to eat, it should be chocolate. Yes. Does that sound right? Well, Kate's enthusiastic about it anyway. Uh, because chocolate is a food group all of its own, isn't it? Is that... Is that right? Or have I misunderstood something there? It's a food group all of us, I'm particularly on Easter Sunday. Although I've got to be honest, I haven't had an Easter egg yet. So I might be seeing if I can raid that little container there as, as the morning goes on. Perhaps there's many things that we might do if we were God. Do any of you remember the, the film Bruce Almighty? From it's, it's getting a little bit old now, but in that film, Bruce has that ultimate opportunity, that opportunity that we're talking about there, where he gets to play the part of God. God basically allows him to fill in for him for several days. And in the process, Bruce, quite frankly, well, he looks after himself. He manipulates situations. He, he manages to get himself a promotion at work. He um, you know, does all sorts of things. And then he realizes that he has to listen to people's prayers. And Bruce really isn't all that enthusiastic about listening to people's prayers. So the prayers are actually an email service and he just puts on an auto reply. And the auto-reply just says yes. So everyone's prayer gets answered with a yes. And quite frankly, the result of everyone's prayer getting answered with a yes is absolute chaos. And so the world starts really to fall apart because everyone's getting a yes answer to their prayer and things are just chaotic. And in the midst of all of this chaos, Bruce ruins the one relationship which is important to him. He loses grace. The woman that he loved because of his self-centred behaviour, because his sense of being God gives him all power and all authority for himself. 
And after all of these mistakes and after all of this self-centered behavior and manipulation, God and Bruce have a little encounter. And God says to Bruce, what is it that you really want? He asks him what he really cares about more than anything else. And as God asks Bruce that question, his mind turns to his ex-girlfriend, Grace. And God asks, do you want her back? To which Bruce replies, no. I simply want her to be happy, no matter what that means. And I think in that moment, Bruce had finally come to understand something of the heart of God. In that moment, Bruce had moved beyond a concept that says, if I have ultimate power, I will manipulate everything to my, for myself. He had moved beyond selfishness to a place of wanting the best for others, to a place of wanting to sacrifice whatever it meant for him so that others might have a better opportunity to understand that a godly love is a love that gives of its very best for others. A godly love is not a love that manipulates power or that takes things to itself, but it is a love that gives for others. We just heard from Colossians chapter 1, and I just want to read a couple of verses again from the message paraphrase, verses 21 to 23. And it says this, You yourselves are a case study of what God does. At one time, you all had your backs turned on God, thinking rebellious thoughts of him, giving him trouble every chance you got. But now, by giving himself completely at the cross, by actually dying for you, Christ brought you over to God's side and put your lives back together, whole and holy, in his presence. You don't walk away from a gift like that. You stay grounded and steady in that bond of trust, constantly tuned into the message, careful not to be distracted or to be diverted. There is no other message, just this one. Not quite what I would do if I was God. This God of ours seems to function in a different way, a way that challenges our preconceptions of what it means to be in control or to have all power and authority. God's relationship with us is not based upon God manipulating or controlling us. It's not based upon God having what he would want or seek, but God functions in a different way, a way that says to us, my relationship with you is based upon love, love that is prepared to give its all for your sake. A love that wants to see your lives transformed and whole. A transforming love. The Easter story is about us. The Easter story is about you and I. Yes, it tells for us the story of the actions of, of God and of Jesus upon that cross, but we are actually central players in this story. We are central to the whole concept of the Easter story because we are the ones who have something to gain. We are the ones who have something to profit from the whole Easter story, in a sense, from all of these dramatic events. It is us that is the centre of the story, that God wants us to have hope and wholeness. And as Colossians 1 has told us, we may turn our backs upon God, we may rebel against God, but we encounter a transforming love in the cross, a, a love that wants to see us made whole. We are central to the story of Easter. That's the whole point. No, unfortunately, not just a chance to eat chocolate or have a nice long weekend, but it's about the ultimate expression of the love of God for us, a love that gives its very best for our sake, so that we might have hope. As our scripture passage tells us, Jesus, God himself, gave himself completely at the cross, actually dying for me and you, so that my life may be put back together whole and holy. I love the way the message paraphrase puts that particular line, whole and holy. Easter means that I can be made whole that my life can be put back together, that all of the things, all of the hopes, everything about me, that God desires that I would be whole, and yes, God desires that I might live fully like him, that I might pursue a life of holiness, so I can live a life full of hope and a life which is marked by the influence of God's spirit, whole and holy. That's the promise of Easter for me and for you, that we might be made whole and holy. 
Do we need that wholeness? As you consider your life, as you consider your experience of this world at this time, do you need that wholeness? And I guess deep within us all is the realisation that things are not quite right or things are not quite as they should be. Our own awareness perhaps of the inconsistencies within ourselves or the problems that we see around us, the way that perhaps we just mess up and make uh, a mess of things, various things in our life, the daily struggles that we have even before we start to look at the circumstances of our world around us. And so do we need that wholeness that God offers to us in the Easter story? Well, I don't know about you, but I do. I need that wholeness. I need that touch of God making me whole and holy. And I guess there are many kinds of perspectives that can be offered to us about the Christian life. You know, popular misconceptions might label Christianity as being about following a whole bunch of rules or of saying one thing on the outside and being a hypocrite, uh, you know, behind closed doors, whatever it is. But our verse here tells us that at the centre of the Christian faith is about being made whole and holy. That Resurrection Sunday is so that we might be made whole. An opportunity of a new life, of a full life. And we need to be careful not to define our Christianity by a bunch of rules or by all the things that we don't do, but rather to see our Christian faith as a step into life, as a step into wholeness, as all that I am and all I can be, a step of transformation. That's what the Easter story is about. Christianity is not about what I won't do, but rather it is about who and what I have become and who and what I am continuing to become. Whole and holy. Transformed. It is now and future. God has changed me now and God continues to change me each and every day. Whole and whole and holy. The transforming love of God, bringing about an internal change, bringing about a hope for eternity, bringing about wholeness in our lives in new ways. And that does not mean that we will not struggle. That does not mean that life will be without its challenges for us, for we will still face various things in our lives. But God's transforming work within us allows us to live lives of hope and love and meaning because of the presence of God in our hearts. We can be whole and holy. And it's not just some future promise. Let's not reduce the resurrection story to a future promise. Let's not reduce our sense of faith to a future promise. It's not just about loving God enough to sort of get our toe in the door of heaven and, and, you know, just having our toe in the door. But it's about full life now, that we are whole and holy now, that God has transformed us and renewed us right here and right now. Let us not settle for a Christianity that is less than that. For a faith that is a fraction of that. Why settle when we can be whole and holy? So how do we respond to that? And when Paul in Colossians says that, you know, the offer of Easter is that we might be whole and holy, how do we respond to that? You know, what do we do with a God like this? A God that says having that ultimate power is not about manipulation, but about giving us life and giving us hope. How do we respond to a God like that? This opportunity for wholeness. And Colossians 1.22, again from the message paraphrase, says it like this. It says, you don't walk away from a gift like that. You don't turn your back on a gift like that. When God offers you this opportunity for wholeness and holiness, you don't walk away from a gift like that. But do we? Do we? I think if I was to examine the various moments of my life and right up to now, I would have to say, at times, I'd walk away from a gift like that. For whatever reason, whatever it might be, transforming love is offered to me, forgiveness is offered to me, bringing me wholeness, but have I walked away from a gift like that? And are you tempted today to walk away from a gift like that? Maybe the reasons are many, doubts, Selfishness, fear, preoccupation with other things. But on this Easter Sunday, as God extends to you an offer of wholeness and holiness, will you turn your back and walk away 
from a gift like that? How do we respond to that gift this Easter? Surely our first response is to embrace all that God is offering to us. To embrace the love of God for us, to allow the transforming spirit of God to do his work of wholeness and holiness within our hearts and lives. And so the first step today of not walking away from a gift like that is simply to be open and say, God, I am open to you and all you would seek to do and bring about in my heart and in my life. But the extension of that is that as we become whole, as we are transformed by holiness, that changes who we are and how we deal with the world around us. And so holy lives transform the world around them as well. That as we become whole and holy, we are encouraged to be about the work of God's transformation in the communities in which he has placed us, to work for renewal and new life for others around us, that because I have been made whole and holy, I desire that others might have a chance for that wholeness and that holiness. We become living advertisements for the grace of God, for the wholeness and holiness that God offers to us. God has given me new life, and I desire that God, that you might experience God's new life in your heart as well. As I think about that, I ponder perhaps where the Salvation Army Camberwell is at this particular life stage in your journey, in your life as a faith community, about hopefully to move back into your renovated property, to be back in that home, that place that is there. And I realise, you know, that the, the temptation perhaps or, or the failure for many churches as they go through a building program and, and then as they go back into their own particular comfortable space is that they look around and they say, well, this is nice. Let's get comfortable. Let's settle. Let's just camp here a while and let God do wonderful things for us. But God has given you a transformed life. God is giving to you a transformed home for your faith community. And so God, I believe, challenges you as as Campbell Salvos to be about the transformation of the community in which you are placed. And so my prayer would be that as you move back into your new facility, your renovated facility, that you will not settle, but that you will say, God, we are here whole and holy, and we desire to work so that the community around us here in Campbellwell might be whole and holy also. Take this opportunity seriously. Don't neglect the chance that you have for a fresh start in that sense. I don't want to overplay the Resurrection Sunday symbolism, but in a sense, you're about to have your own resurrection as a faith community as you move back into the neighbourhood, as you move back into your building, and so be a beacon of new life. Be a beacon of wholeness and holiness so that the community of Campbellwell might be transformed by the love of God because of your presence within it. As I think about that, I reflect upon the fact that when the Salvation Army first came to Australia in the 1880s, that whole communities were transformed. The towns and suburbs were transformed. They were changed because this weird bunch of people, the Salvation Army, had come into town. And they brought with them the presence and the peace of God, offering wholeness and holiness to the communities around them. People were changed. Hope was shared. Australia was no longer the same when this strange group of people, the Salvation Army, entered town. And I don't know enough of the history of the suburb of Camberwell. I didn't do my research well enough or early enough. I don't know the stories of what happened when the Salvation Army moved into Camberwell, but I do know. I do know that the Salvation Army Camberwell Corps has been a vibrant place of wholeness and holiness over many decades where lives, thousands of lives have been transformed and that is what I pray will be the future for you as you move back into that place that you may indeed be beacons of wholeness beacons of holiness and that the community in which you are placed will know you are there and their lives will be touched by the love of God because you are there whole and holy. So, 
this Easter? What are you going to do with the transforming love and wholeness that God offers you? Can you walk away from a gift like that? First and foremost, that's a personal question. God offers to you this Easter Sunday wholeness, a fullness of life, and holiness, an opportunity to become more and more like Jesus himself. And so what is your response? That's the first question. What is your response to that wholeness and holiness that God offers to you? Surely we can't walk away from a gift like that. And as we embrace that wholeness and that holiness, will we be that transformational influence? That's the second question. Will you offer that wholeness and that holiness to the community in which God has placed you? And will the community of Camberwell know very well that the Salvation Army is in its midst because you offer the wholeness of the kingdom of God, the presence of God to the people around you. Ask the worship team to uh, come back. We're going to sing a song together as we reflect a little upon the message from Colossians to us today and upon what God might be saying to our hearts and lives. And so, just as we sing through these words, what a beautiful name, I want you to take the opportunity to answer those two questions for yourself. Will you walk away from a gift like that? Will you embrace the wholeness and the holiness that God offers to you today? Perhaps there are things that you simply need to bring before God today and spend a little bit of time in prayer saying, God, I just feel a little bit shackled. I feel that things are weighing me down. I seek your wholeness. I seek your holiness within my life. Feel free to do that. And perhaps to grapple with that second question, for everyone who's a part of this faith community, particularly for the leadership team of this faith community, well, how will we be those beacons of wholeness and holiness? How will we move back into that neighbourhood and people will know that we are here with the transforming love of God? Let us not walk away from a gift like that. So we're going to sing together. And whatever's right for you, we are seated. <coughs> Simply do encounter God in prayer there, or if you want to come and kneel at a place of prayer here, or perhaps just to kneel at the cross, feel free to do that. Just take some time. Speak with God. And let's not walk away from a gift like that.
pray. Lord, on this Easter Sunday, this Resurrection Sunday, we celebrate the life that we found in that we find in you. We celebrate the wholeness and the fullness of life that we find in you. We celebrate the call to holiness to be transformed each and every day more and more like you, simply to, to be like Jesus. Lord, we celebrate this. We celebrate it because we are recipients of your great grace. We are the beneficiaries of your transforming love. We are the ones who benefit from this Easter story. 2,000 years old, but we benefit today. You make us whole. Thanks for that, Lord. You call us to be your holy people, living in the strength and the power of your spirit. Thank you for that, Lord. May we be the people that you call us to be. And may we, as hard as it is at times, whatever might turn our eyes in different directions, may we not walk away from a promise and a hope and a wholeness like that. May we embrace your love and the, the life that you offer us. And Lord, on this Easter Sunday, I do pray for my friends here at Campbell Salvos. I would pray that they would be a beacon of your light and your love in the community in which they are soon to return in a physical way. Lord, may they share wholeness. May they share holiness with the community in which they are placed. And may lives be touched by your love. May communities be transformed by the values of your kingdom. May life simply be so much more because your people are in that place. So Lord, help them not to settle. Help them to feel uncomfortable enough in their beautiful renovated building that they will not settle, but they will be your people in that community. Use the Lord, whole and holy. Let them do your work. We pray this in your name. Amen and amen. We have a final song that we're going to sing together as we conclude this Easter Sunday worship. At the name of Jesus, it says, every knee shall bow. So I invite you to stand with us as we join together in singing. I think three verses we've been limited to. I think, I think there's a fair few more, but we're going with three verses. So let us worship him. Worship our Lord and Saviour in these words. <laughs> Friday, we most of us arrive on Friday 
knowing the story. And not just the Good Friday story, but the Sunday story. And so there's a challenge for us to bring that anew and afresh again. So thank you for doing that, for this reminder of God's love. For me, I've been um, this, this image of, of a mother embracing her child in the middle of a tragedy to save her life. Um, that's been fresh on my mind this Easter. So thank you for reminding me that that's God's love for each of us today. But you didn't leave us there. We know God's love. We have a challenge to be whole and holy. So thank you that uh, this challenge not to settle for us today. So there's a burden as well because for those of us that have been enjoying hot cross buns and Easter eggs and a break from work, the burden of the preacher is that we're carrying this message all the way through this long weekend. So here is just a tiny, a small gift from us and an opportunity, if you choose, to take Priya out or something so that you and Priya also get that opportunity of a break as well. So thank you very much, Thanks, Aaron. It's been good to be able to share with you. Uh, I like to think there's a little bit of who I am that comes from Campbell Salvos. I was a junior soldier. I've seen that children's story today from when I was, what, mum and dad, nine till about 12, uh, went to Campbell South Primary School, came to the core here. So there's a little bit of me, um, or a little bit of you in me, and a bit of the influence. That's been great to share with you in that way. A benediction. Eternal God, you who are author of our lives, source, of love, source of transformation, we worship you. Jesus, in your sacrifice, may we find wholeness and fullness of our lives. May we be inspired to live after your example. And so, Spirit, empower us to be beacons of your kingdom, to live out your love in the world around us. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Amen.